The Supreme Court of Canada recognized that no one should be forced to suffer a cruel death. As of today, the laws against medically assisted death in Canada are null and void. Yesterday, the government failed to meet the Supreme Court's deadline to fill that void. So, what are the options for patients and what are the dangers for doctors? Our national checkup panel is here to shed some light. Danielle Martin is Vice President of Women's College Hospital. Samira Sinha is Director of Geriatrics for Sinai Health System. James Downer is a critical care and palliative care physician at the University Health Network. And Carrie Bowman is a bioethicist at the University of Toronto. Their thoughts in a moment, but first, here's what's at stake. Why is the Prime Minister pushing a bill which he knows goes against the Charter? Yeah. Doctor-assisted death became legal in Canada at midnight. Up until then, you needed to get a judge's approval to seek help in dying. And some argue that you still should. Right now, the lack of federal guidelines leaves the country with a patchwork of provincial protocols for doctors to follow. And that brings us to the next dilemma. So that dilemma is what's expected of doctors now. Three doctors, one bioethicist here tonight. I'm going to start with you, James. What... Are doctors facing a bit of a limbo here? How scary is this? No, it's not actually that scary. Not a great deal has changed yesterday. Um, it, in fact, it's been legal to perform physician-assisted death since February with the permission of the Superior Court of your jurisdiction. Uh, the only thing that's really changed is that we no longer know if we actually need to go to the courts anymore to obtain permission for that. Um, at the moment, the Ministry of Health of this province is recommending that we continue to do that, that and so do the lawyers. Um, the more important question was not what was whether it was legal or illegal. Of course, it once something is legal, but more importantly, the, the professional standards were the more important thing. And the College uh, of Physicians and Surgeons in every province in this country has had guidelines in place since before February, telling physicians what they should do when confronted with a request for an assisted death. So it lays out the whole pol the policy, the procedure, all of the steps that you need to take, and all the documentation uh, that you need to keep in order to to make sure that you're compliant with the professional code. That's a much higher. So is that the court order then that we're talking about? Is so, that what it leads to? Well, that uh, ultimately the idea that you are you, you just simply exceeding the legal bar is one thing, but the professional bar is much higher, and that bar has remained in place the whole time. And those those professional guidelines are still in place and guiding physicians. So it's not really that scary for us. So it, it sounds, if James is right, then th th in most cases people will have to go through the court system. Still, is is that? Does that make things clear enough, do you think, Danielle? Well, I think actually in organizations like hospitals across the country, um, policies have been put in place. I mean, I think we've all known this is coming. It's not a surprise. So mm -hmm. um, even in the absence <clears throat> of federal legislation, I think the medical community and the healthcare community have responded. I think what's less clear actually is what to do in primary care. And actually what we know from other jurisdictions is um, people are very likely to go and see their family physician um, or their primary care provider when, uh, when they realize that they've come to the point where they want to have this conversation and in the absence of an institutional structure around you like a hospital to help you to have that conversation and figure out how to make that decision together um, I think there's still a little more of a sense of uncertainty and, and you know those are conversations that are going to evolve over time and certainly the guidance of the professional colleges and the courts are really helpful um, for that purpose. Uh, Samir, you deal with the elderly. Um, are you feeling clear about everything that uh, must well, be decided? It's, you know, I think the scary part is there's still a few unknowns, uh, for example. So I think the physician community has been very good about trying to organize ourselves so that if we do get confronted with questions or people are interested in talking about this, we now know who we can refer to. We know we have a, a framework because I think what we don't want to be in a position is, is that if someone needs help and needs, uh, needs support that we we will fail to provide that for them. So I think we're organizing ourselves, but from a perspective as, as a geriatrician, thinking about my elderly patients, especially with a number who have dementia, for example, you know, common questions now become, well, what does the legislation say about me? You know, can I actually, you know, am I going to be allowed to 
make a decision in future, and that's still something that until the final legislation's in place, um, it makes it a little bit of a gray zone uh, for us to work in. So while we're in this gray zone, Kerry, it sounds like James is suggesting that in most cases, doctors will only feel comfortable if courts are involved. Mm -hmm. What do you think, as an ethicist, what do you think of that? You know, the problem with that, and I, I understand why it's happening, but in, in virtually all the provinces and territories, for now, it looks like people are going to use the courts. The problem is people are facing really serious, massive illness. They're really sick. Uh, their families are under huge stress. And it feels like in court that their values and choices are being judged. And I, I actually think it's an infringement. I understand why it's happening right now, but I think it's the patients and their families that really carry the brunt of this in this period. If I can add also, I, adding on to that, I think we're all clearly disappointed that the Parliament was not able to pass a law in time. Um, and it's important to underscore how much it actually costs to go through the process of obtaining a court permission. Uh, you have to get many lawyers involved, and this is running not into the thousands. Not every family can afford that. This yeah. is running into the many thousands of dollars. This is a prohibitive cost for many people. Mm. What happens if <coughs> not all doctors, Danielle, are comfortable with this? If they don't proceed now that it's legal, um, are they breaking the law? No, so you're not obligated, and the Supreme Court decision was pretty clear on this, that physicians have a right to uh, not to perform assisted death if either their, for example, their religious or their moral beliefs prohibit them from doing so, but they will probably be required to refer, um, So, uh, which is the situation that I think we're all you know, pretty familiar with um, in medical practice. I think what we're going to find is that there will emerge sort of three groups of providers, and by the way, it won't necessarily only be physicians. Those who will, will do this, and it will actually become a focus of their practice, those who will never do it because they have some objection to it, and then a huge number in the middle for whom it won't be a regular part of our practice, but for the right person with whom we have a relationship, um, a patient who, um, where that conversation kind of emerges naturally over the course of taking care of someone, um, with the right supports in place, a physician might feel comfortable proceeding with assisted death. And so we're going to need to think about in the way that we structure our, our organizations for this, um, for this new reality. We're going to need to think about how to put things in place for all three groups. Hmm. But, Samir, you were saying that a few issues still haven't been resolved. So, like, are doctors properly protected here? We're hearing that nurses, for example, haven't, they, they haven't been considered in this. Yeah, I don't, think it's about, I don't think it's about protection for physicians. I think it's about, about knowing kind of how to actually negotiate the landscape. So, as Danielle was just saying, that one, one thing that we've been able to do in, in Ontario and other provinces, for example, is, you know, our local government, what's reassuring for the public should be, that you know we're now creating a directory so that for example I know that if a patient would like to discuss this with me happy to discuss it but certainly I will make a referral on to somebody and now what we're doing is creating frameworks so that we can refer people so the key is that as Danielle was saying is that we're going to have to you know we cannot not talk about this we cannot not provide our patient service but there are going to be mechanisms where we can at least support people so in that sense we're not going to be breaking the law but there's still a lot of murky questions here as well. So is there a proper balance there, Carrie, between you know, protecting doctors' professional responsibilities? Yeah, I, I, and there is, but again, I mean, a lot of the focus in recent weeks is, is on professional practice. And again, you know, what we need to be looking at as well is the fundamental rights of Canadian citizens right now. And so much of the discourse is conscientious objection, professional practice. This is now a right. Uh, Canadians now have a right to this, and we have to find access. So the fact that registries are beginning to emerge nationally is a wonderful, wonderful thing, so people can actually access that, and I think it's a great idea. So, James, a lot of people have said that perhaps having no law is better than a bad law. The CMA, the Canadian Medical Association, is saying, yes, please give us a law. Uh, but what do you think about that argument? Well, I think, that's, I think it's correct to say that no law is better than a bad law. The current bill, as it's proposed, is problematic in a couple of ways, but most notably that in addition to the definition of grievous and irremediable illness that was in the Carter decision, they've added a proviso that somebody has to have what's called a reasonably foreseeable death. Mm -hmm. This is a term that is causing a great deal of consternation to physicians. Uh, it's a legal term that means something to a lawyer. It does doesn't mean a lot to a physician. Um, again, not to be flippant, anybody who is alive has a reasonably foreseeable death. Certainly anybody with what is otherwise a grievous and irremediable illness well, the has Senate, a reasonable foreseeable death. Well, the Senate, a number of death. senators are saying that they're going to be asking for profound change on both sides mm -hmm, of this argument. Right. So, I mean, Kerry, is, is, is no law? How big a problem is that, no law? 
Well, you know, in Canada, we've done this before. And the, wh where we have done this before is abortion uh, in the 80s, in which the law was struck down and not replaced. We're really the only country in the Western world with no form of abortion laws. It's tough going. And, and the problem with that is there's variation from province to province, which creates questions of justice. But mostly we do, I think, a very good job in Canada in terms of making abortion available uh, to, to Canadian women. And we have falling abortion rates. I mean, there's a lot of good things that are going on. So it is possible. What do you think of that idea, Danielle? No law. Well, I mean, it's... It, I. We're going to need to have a law. I mean, at some point, you know, that there's a there's a Supreme Court decision. The federal government needs to respond. And so, um, I think that this. I do believe that this situation that we're in, the abortion, uh, the history of abortion legislation notwithstanding, I think the situation we're in right now is a temporary one. And so, um, you know, the question is, how do we make sure as a healthcare community that um, we're ready to respond? now. In fact, when we've been ready to respond for months now to requests that come up so that we're not waiting for the government to, to sort of give mm -hmm. us the green light when, in fact, it's clear that Canadians do have the right to this service and we have an obligation to figure out how to provide it for them. I want to move on to a somewhat different angle on this, which is uh, end-of-life care. There's been a lot of push uh, by people who aren't comfortable with assisted dying saying, you know, let's just make it palliative care, end-of-life care better. Um, how important, how big a difference would that make? Well, I think it's a huge opportunity here. I think the interesting thing is when we talk about physician-assisted dying, this is a rights-based issue, whether or not people can have access to this or not. But when we talk about end-of-life care, which can include advanced care planning, it includes palliative care services and so on. Advanced We've, care planning as in terms of don't resuscitate me? Well, of? I mean, even more so. It's about, you know, what would you want your choices to be around your health care, your living situations and so on, if you couldn't make those decisions for yourself? And when we actually look at, you know, people engaging in those conversations about the future, we don't like to talk about death as a majority of Canadians. And so when you actually look at the statistics, 86% of Canadians haven't heard about advanced care planning. 80% of Canadians haven't really participated in and or even had these conversations with their loved ones. And then when you start thinking about physicians, even talking about advanced care planning and these issues and about end of life care, 52% of primary care doctors tell us that they don't really feel very comfortable about having robust conversations around this issue. So the key is that accessing palliative care services, end-of-life care services, it's a patchwork quilt. Is there, is there a link here, Carrie, between the call for assisted death and, and or would better end-of-life care sort of move that? I mean, I, I think the two can be blended together, and American data suggests that they can be, and I think they will be with time. The problem is, in, in, these, in this difficult zone we're in now, which is, you know, essentially the summer of of 2016, uh, we're really losing track of a lot of things because of the complexity. But I think longer term, we can keep all this integrated and what do, do well. Think, well, I think, and, and I agree, I, I, I want to pick up on both of those points. First of all, the, the real problem with prolonging this debate and continuing, if we pass a bad law that was going to come back to the Supreme Court, is it's going to continue to distract attention away from what we really need to be focusing yeah. on, which is ensuring high quality palliative care for everybody. But it is a false choice. It is not correct to say that we can only focus on one and not the other. They're two distinct questions. Legalizing physician assisted dying does not let us off the hook on the palliative care debate. Improving palliative care does not um, relieve us of the need to guarantee the rights of access to physician assisted dying. I got a wrap on this topic. I uh, have a sense that this won't be over in a week. <laughs> um, <laughs> I so think you're right. <laughs> need you all to stand by because we're going to talk about one other thing right after this short break when we'll turn to an issue that affects us all. It's a trend across the provinces to move away from annual physicals. So is that a smart way to cut costs or does it put you in danger? We're back with our national checkup panel, this time to talk about checkups. Seeing your family physician for a checkup every year may be your best protection against cancer. It used to be accepted wisdom. An annual checkup lets you get the jump on health problems before they get out of hand. Say, ah. Uh... But that wisdom is being challenged. Last week, Quebec stopped paying for annual checkups for healthy patients. It's following the lead of BC, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland and Labrador. A few years ago, Ontario took steps to tailor the annual checkup and strip away unnecessary tests. So, is it all about money? And does it put you at risk? 
So, James, I'm going to leave you out of this because you're the palliative specialist. I'll start with you, Danielle. What, what do you think? Is not funding these annual checkups a good or a bad idea? It's a good idea. We've long known in family medicine that there is not good evidence for the annual checkup, and it takes up a lot of time um, in, in our day as family physicians that we could be spending either seeing people when they're sick or seeing them for a much more tailored and personalized conversation about screening and reducing your risk of developing illness. So it's not about giving up on, pre on uh, prevention, but more about recognizing that these long 45 minute um, you know, conversations where we're listening to your chest, even though you don't have a cough and you feel perfectly fine, um, is actually not a good use of anybody's time including the patients hmm. do you agree Sweet. absolutely and I think the key is I think we've you know you saw the old video there saying that this is part of the common lore that you need to get your checkup done we do this with our cars we do this with so many other things so we think well shouldn't we do this with our bodies as well but the evidence doesn't really support it and the key is if we free up our family doctors to have more time to focus on those issues that are arising at the time, we can see them quicker and we can get more focused health care. So then why not just say if you're healthy, you don't need to go, but if you have an issue you can uh, that you're worried about, you need to be reassured or checked up every year? Well, I think this is the key thing is that, you know, people say, well, what are we losing? And I think there's a sense of loss that maybe the annual checkup, if we can get that in our patients' you know, minds, means there's a reason for them to engage with us. Because there's large populations, like young men in particular, who, you know, after they get their final pediatric vaccination will not see the doctor until... Well, I thought it wasn't just young men. <laughs> oh, it's uh, men in general, exactly. So the question is, it's probably important for you to check in once a year, but not necessarily for a full annual physical, for example, because, you know, losing that opportunity to check in on a regular basis is an opportunity to, you know, to build a relationship with your family provider. And this doesn't apply to kids? It doesn't little. apply to kids, of course not, and it doesn't apply to older people or people with multiple chronic diseases. And of course there are lots of things that we should be doing even for healthy people on a regular basis. You know, people should be getting their blood pressure checked and they should be screened for diabetes and have pap smears for cervical cancer screening, etc. at, at um, particular intervals. Um, when you're but feeling, not every year? But not every year. And you know, so depending on the individual's risk and stage of life, it's not going to be every year. Um, and again, not for a 45 minute appointment to do all of this other stuff where we sort of look in your eyes and, um, you know, feel your belly or whatever, I, what, we're, what we should be doing is a much more focused assessment that says, given your personal family history, your genetic risks, um, the chronic diseases that you yourself have, your age, et cetera, these are the areas where we're going to focus. We don't need to do a head-to-toe checkup. I don't know. What do you think, Kerry? I guess for a lot of yeah. Canadians, it's sort of like it's a right. That well, and we <laughs> grew up on it, a lot of us. And, and it, it's, it's very ingrained in our thinking. But, you know, we have a public system. And from an ethical point of view, we need to target uh, money where it is needed to patients that need it. And, you know, science informs ethics and ethics informs science. And if the evidence isn't there, which it's not, we need to stop doing it and spending money elsewhere. So we're clear then, Samir, this, this is just about money. It's not just about money, it's about, it's about quality and value, right? And the idea that if we think about in a publicly funded system, we want to make sure that we spend money on our family physicians providing care. People can't access family doctors in a timely manner, maybe because they're so busy doing annual physicals. But if we actually had them not doing that and supporting them to do things that the evidence supports, we can get better value with our dollars. Well, thank you. That was very interesting. So was the chat about assisted dying, and uh, we'll see where all of this goes. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you.